All right, cool. So super last minute podcast today. Um, thank you for doing this, John. So for people out there who may not, who are listening, who may not know, um, tell me, explain to me who you are and what your background is. Well, I'm Albanian first off, uh, and uh, I'm involved with the Gambino family since I'm a kid, so literally since I'm a young kid. And I moved down here to Tampa, back and forth from New York to Tampa, Florida, to set up some businesses, which I did. I set up a parking company. I set up nightclubs, glass companies, and uh, I based down here bookmaking. And we ran things back and forth from Florida down to, back to the East Coast. Okay. What now? What specifically? Um, what specifically did you do, like in your height of being involved in all of this and being involved with the Gambino family and? What what are you specifically known for? Well, I was known as an enforcer of the Gambino family. Uh, okay. Specifically, I worked later on in the years for the Gotti family uh, directly and uh, was their enforcer, their killer, their uh, the guy that went that you didn't want to see if they had a problem with us. Okay. So obviously, um, if you're admitting you were a killer and you're sitting here right now, not behind bars, how did that happen? <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> I uh, was in jail many years. Uh, Tampa, actually, my case was based out of Tampa, Florida. Although I was a, a New Yorker and born and raised in New York, mm -hmm. we expanded business down here to Florida, and uh, the Middle District of Florida ended up sending an indictment RICO case against me, and I went on a lot on the run, which they say on the lam, uh, to probably about 20 countries, and eventually I was caught in Brazil uh, by Interpol and imprisoned in Brazil for two and a half years fighting extradition back to this country, which eventually they got me back here and I did the circuit of prisons in uh, Tampa between uh, Falkenberg, Hernandez County, Pinellas County, Hillsboro, Lake County. I've been in all these jails here, Miami, MCC. So uh, I'm very familiar with the uh, the system in, in Florida, Miami, Tampa area. Okay, and what were you, what exactly were you locked up for? I was charged for uh, drug dealing, uh, murders, murder conspiracies, assaults, and uh, just a slew of everything which they bottle up in what they call RICO. I was involved in a RICO racketeering case and with the Gambino family and uh, considered a street boss. Holy shit. Okay, so how, how did you get out of prison if you had a murder charge? How did you beat a murder charge amongst all of these other insane charges? Well, when I was down in... in uh, uh, Brazil, when Interpol catches me, I'm doing uh, two, about two years, two and a half years there. Well, I, I did exactly two and a half years there, and I was brought back here on Christmas Eve 2006, almost 2007. Uh, extradition law is a 30-year sentence between countries. So I'm facing life here. Once I left the country, in order for them to bring me back, the maximum time I can get on that extradition treaty is the maximum life sentence in Brazil, which is 30 years. So once they wow. bring me back, it's a 30-year term. And, uh, and how old were you then? About 25 on that. I was uh, in, in my 40s, about 40, 41 years old when they when they grabbed me. Okay. With a 30-year sentence? Well, prior to that, I've been in and out of prisons uh, basically my adult life. So I was in and out. Uh, I did a three-and-a-half-year bid on a gun charge. I did some assault charges. I did uh, six months, a year, three months, three months, violations, uh, bribery cases, so I'm accustomed to the system. Wow. And so, so it seems like you obviously got a lot of time knocked off that sentence, right? I mean, how did you get all that time knocked off? Well, once I come back to Tampa, Florida, well, before I come back to Tampa, Florida, there's a couple of guys that were involved in me, associates of mine that fly down to Brazil and they give me paperwork on uh, certain guys in the Gambino family, one of them being uh, the son of John Gotti Sr., the boss of the Gambino family, from the 90s, uh, 80s to the 90s, who dies in prison. But his son was what they call queen of the day. So queen of the day is somebody that walks into the government, makes a, a deal with them to give up crime, uh, criminal activity, and he's free to talk about anything, can't get charged with it, at the same time giving up activities of uh, associates, members of the Gambino family or of other organizations and other families. Mm -hmm. So that was, I guess, around 2005, 2004, 2005, thereabouts, uh, while I was in those penitentiaries, Gotti's son, uh, Gotti Jr., was queen of the day. He was queen of the day, meaning that he talked to the FBI and well, got full protection from them? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly, cooperating. 
Most people don't know what that is. And then it translates into what they call a 302. I mean, you're never going to get all the documents of right. what he was talking about. But uh, the thing is, he met with the government and he started cooperating. Yeah. How old were you when you started getting involved with these guys? Uh, I was a kid. My father was involved with uh, my uncle in, uh, in a gambling business. Mm -hmm. My uncle was a, ran a game called Three Card Monte in the Bronx with uh, Charlie Luciano. was a very famous gangster's name, Lucky Luciano, mm -hmm. uh, the cousin of Charlie Luciano Blackie was my uncle's partner. So I would be at those games at five, six years old. And uh, prior to, I mean, after that, uh, Andy Ruggiano was the boss in my neighborhood. Andy Ruggiano was a, a quiet Don in my neighborhood. He was uh, the guy that ran our area for the Gambino family, uh, very famous gangster. He was uh, straightened out or became a made member of the mafia through Albert Anastasia. Albert Anastasia was Murder Inc. He's also a very famous gangster killer. I hung around that family and uh, played baseball with them, boxed with them, went to the gym with them, yeah. and uh, became very familiar with the ways of the mafia being quiet and underground. And uh, despite what people see later on in the Gotti uh, era of the loud and the uh, boisterous, it's not the way uh, the gangsters operated uh, right. for within the mob. It was a quiet organization. It was supposed to be there. Right. So guys like Andy Ruggiano was a true boss. People really don't know who it is because... Behind the scenes. He's very quiet. Yeah, behind the scenes guy. So what chain of events led up to you actually meeting... The Gaudis, or Gaudi, Gaudi Sr. was the first guy you worked with, right? Well, you, well, you know, again, we're, I'm around the Ruggiano family, and I'm around and, and meeting different gangsters. And, did and you know, would, like, when you when you started and you were with those guys, did you know who the Gaudis were? I mean... Nah, they, did, they didn't have that name back then. Okay. Uh, Gaudi uh, Sr. ends up getting straightened out in, in the late 70s. His brother, Jeannie, a little before him, a couple of years before him. Mm -hmm. I don't think they ever get that right in the media. Jeannie was actually uh, a made member first. Jeannie Gotti. Jeannie Gotti, yeah. okay. And uh, Senior Gotti ends up getting a name for himself in the early 80s, uh, in the 70s through a, a murder, but in the early 80s where the public really knows him. And... Uh, Later on, Pat Andy Ruggiano goes to prison, so Senior steps in his shoes and becomes the uh, the boss in our area, which is a captain and skipper at that time. Okay. So as as time pro progresses, you yeah, know, I'm meeting different mobsters in the Gambino family, and Senior becomes one of the guys I meet, and Junior I meet through mutual friends. We're all in the same neighborhood, so it's not really mm -hmm. somebody you would say to you, it's like... Uh, living in the Tampa area and you go to International Mall and that's where the scene is set and everybody sees each other on a daily basis. So it's, you know, just a mixture of where we live in the area. And uh, one of the authors, a writer, Lou Romano, talks about, uh, you know, your zip code and your zip code uh, determines uh, the way of your life. And our zip code was, uh, if you could spell our zip code, my area was 11421. But if you spelled it a different way, it would be Mobsters Incorporated. I mean, it was just gangsters around, and that's how we were raised. And what specific area was that? Like, what specific town was that? I grew up in Woodhaven, but the aligning neighborhoods, Ozone mm -hmm. Park was also a gangster area, and Howard Beach is uh, where the Gotti family lived. Okay, I don't even know where Woodhaven is, sorry. Uh, it was in New York. It's, uh, it's, New York. it's okay. a Queens. Queens. Queens borough, oh, Queens, and, New York. And it's, and it's in that area. It's different townships in, okay. within Queens. Yeah. Wow. So... What was the working relationship with you and Gotti when you guys first met? Like, what was the first interaction like, and how did that become a working relationship between you guys? Well, I was known to be a scrappy kid prior to that, and you yeah. know, I was always fighting. You were a fighter? Yeah, I was a fighter. I was always in the gyms, but I was a fighter in the street more so. I wasn't mm. a big guy. I was a small guy. I was good with my hands, and uh, most of the guys from my neighbor were tough. You know, I'm not the only guy that was fighting in, in our neighborhood. Everybody fights. Mm -hmm. Whether they're good fighters or not, they fight. Okay. And, and Jamaica Avenue, where I was from, was uh, more of a poverty-stricken area, uh, lower middle class, I guess, lower class, depending on where you live. Jamaica Avenue? Jamaica Avenue, okay. it's Queens. Okay. And uh, where the Gaudis lived, where Howard Beach, it was more of a money area. So some of those kids from that area would come up to Jamaica Avenue, where the Ruggiano family was from and where I was from. And uh, they started nicknaming our area for, for the violence it was and Death Haven instead of Wood Haven. And wow. So as time progresses, the kids are all meeting each other through, through sports, through activities, through, you know, different things. And uh, 
Gaudis were one of the names that, and one of the families that were around the area or would come up to our area. And we started mixing with each other and continued in criminal enterprise. We were all on the streets, either selling drugs, moving uh, money, bookmaking, uh, hurting guys, and hustling. So, Wow. That was our everyday life. I mean, this is what goes on in, in our areas. Okay. So, so you guys kind of like, you guys rubbed shoulders. You guys knew a lot of the same people. Um, and then how did he, did he, was he the one that approached you and said, Hey, I want you to be my hitman," Or did he say, Hey, I got a job for you. How did he introduce you into the, into well, his life? He was dealing drugs with another guy, Johnny Gabbett. They were moving uh pot and small stuff, not really small levels, but you know, nothing major, major truckloads, but you know, a hundred pounds they were buying at a time, 200 pounds, you know, something like that. Yeah. And, uh, that was his partner and Gabbett also knew me and lived around the corner from me. So I, I first moved, meet the son that way. The father I meet through some of his associates and older guys and through his son. And I start mixing with them. They're big heroin movers and they mm. asked me to get involved in a heroin trade. So I start slowly getting involved in heroin besides, uh, mar besides the pot business, marijuana, cocaine, and like any business, you expand. So you start in one drug, and we're expanding all over, and I'm moving drugs Okay. from a small level to a big level. Okay. And uh, from there, I just step into the violence. It's just a slow process of... Uh, so you started making quite a bit of money moving drugs? Oh, yeah, we're all making money, big money. Really? Yeah, we come in from... Uh, you know, I was probably at the time I was talking about a million a month. and uh, Holy shit. You know, and I think that's low balling and being conservative. Uh, so... The, Different guys that were around with us did interviews and said that that number is not right. It's higher than that. Guys mm -hmm. that actually were my friends and later on became my enemies, guys I shot, that spoke up and did interviews and said, I think John's underplaying the amount of money they were making and how violent he was. But, I mean, everybody's going to have an opinion of uh, what was accurate, what wasn't. Uh, but the, the accurate number, I think, is safe to say about a million a month. Holy crap. And how did you trans... <laughs> So what, what transitioned you from making money dope dealing to, like, were you actually, like, getting paid to execute people? Well, it doesn't really work like that. I don't know how it works, so yeah, I'm ignorant yeah, I'll, to it. I'll walk you through, <laughs> okay, I'll walk give me you a, through it. Give me a, I, I'll give you an example. I'm a drug dealer. You're a drug dealer. Somebody tells me you're moving drugs in the neighborhood. It's not that I'm sitting there peddling, you know, uh, quarter keys, keys, grams on the corner. There's people that are working for us. And if they tell me that, about a guy like yourself, we'll approach you find out what you're doing and uh you're told to do business with us for us and uh i'll, I'll give you guys that uh, run around the street and if you don't do business with them you know you're gonna jeopardize yourself whether you're gonna get hurt or killed depending on what you do and so uh, in the in the uh the middle of us doing business everyday business guys are getting killed guys are getting shot guys mm -hmm. are getting hurt uh, to expand our business. To expand to, the business is the well, main. Well, it's not always to expand. It's always to preserve it. Uh, anybody that's challenging it. And it's not just the drug business. It's the same for the sports business, the union business. So mm. depending on uh, what the issue is, you know, the whoever's in charge at the time, whether it's, you know, uh, Fat Andy Ruggiano, whether it's Gotti or whoever, whoever's calling the shots, they'll delegate work to guys like me and different guys to go out and we, you know, we either collect their money, shooting guys, moving drugs, bookmaking, and hustling the streets. So we're controlling our uh, our streets under the flag of the Gambino family, and uh, this is uh, everyday life for us. Wow. How old were you when you first shot somebody? Uh, I first shot somebody was probably around, uh, I guess, 18, something like that, 18, wow. 19. And, uh, that's gotta like seriously do something to you when you're doing something, when you're doing that, that young, like violence at that age, it's gotta change. It's gotta, you know, you, you, you grow up in an area where I was one of the slow walkers, what you would say, as far as, uh, committing crimes or, uh, killing or hurting guys. Actually, I had a slew of friends, cousins, uh, my cousins, my friends, they, they were all, uh, I, a lot more dangerous than me. So I was a little more of a slow walker. Okay. And uh, as crazy as that seems, I, I mean, I, later on I bypass everybody and I start becoming the, the guy that's doing all this work. And one by one, my cousins are getting killed. My friends are getting killed. And I'm out uh, doing the work and killing and, and moving uh, towards the hierarchy of the Gambino family. Wow. How many, how, how many people would you say that you ended up shooting and, or killing? You know, again, I, I, I just spewed it out, uh, spewed out on the uh, value entertainment names, places, 
dates, uh, witnesses of, of what I did. And I yeah. held back probably about 25 shootings <sighs> that uh, I could continue with. And, you know, we're doing shows, movies, and a lot of that stuff and dates and times and places we're, we're yeah. saving for the actual films that are coming okay. out. The uh, We're doing a series coming out. Yeah, I guess that's a big question. I mean, I mean, judging by, you know, your past and like the violence and, and all the criminal violence that you were involved in and all the shootings and killings and the jail time you did. I mean, obviously those are super inter interesting stories, but so why do this? So why come out in the media and, and why talk about all this and, and, and tell the story? Like why do this? Well, because here's one of the reasons when I first was in court uh, during the trials, uh, the Gotti family, their lawyers said I shot about 60 guys. So, I never denied any how many people I shot, how many people I hurt, how many people I baseball batted, stabbed. I mean, I was very famous for saying, yes, I did. You know, so I don't deny that walk I took in the streets. But, you know, one of the things people know that I do now is try to help kids not to follow that path and follow those footsteps and save themselves a lot of pain and, uh, and uh, anguish and maybe save their life. So mm -hmm. I'm out there uh, publicly. Uh, doing talks at colleges, at schools, high schools, at uh, juvenile centers. And my uh, thing is to try to help some kids save their lives around the world. And, you know, I've been around the world. I do yeah. talks in Switzerland. I've done talks in the UK. I've done them in uh, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, okay. this area in Tampa, Florida. And I'm very yeah. public uh, doing lectures all over and, and trying to, you know, give people the real of what goes on within the streets, what goes on within the mafia and murders and, you know, the everyday life of being a criminal. Mm -hmm. And you said, you also said that you're, you're pretty close friends with Sammy the Bull. Sammy is a, a guy that uh, obviously was an underboss at the Gambino family. Most people know him. If you don't know him, you can look him up. And uh, he's just recently done an interview in Value Entertainment, which I also done uh, a couple of weeks prior to him. And you get uh, the basis of his story, uh, mine, and uh, some of the things we discuss and talk about. And Sammy was uh, a very powerful underboss in the Gambino family, very powerful guy in the street. And uh, he was betrayed. And during, you know, the problem with the street and the street world is people that are, don't really understand it and they watch some TV or they listen to these shows, they think they really understand what you sign up for and how treacherous it is. And they really don't get it. But uh, if you sat at a table with us, or you came in a room like this and you sat with us, that opinion that everybody spoos out so you know easily on a computer mm -hmm. would would be uh, slid back about 30 steps. They wouldn't be speaking like that. So, you know, the guys that do understand the life and understand the treachery, it's uh, Machiavelli times 20, if you know what Machiavelli is, if you ever read it. And, and it's, it's a treacherous life. And the reason why we're out here doing this stuff, obviously, some of the things I do, magazines, movies, uh, series, TV series, you do get paid for. But the the uh, the drive for me to do this or any of the things I do at schools yeah. are uh, out of uh, trying to help kids. And it's not for money. It's not monetary. I don't get paid for it. And that I'm not trying to get paid for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just to, for kids to help save somebody's life, hopefully. Wow. That's strong of you, man. I mean, I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you taking your time to, to share these stories. I mean what kind of what kind of lesson like if you could talk go talk to yourself back then if you could say something to yourself back when you were 18 years old like what was one of the big what's the biggest lesson that you learned from that whole experience from from when you first started drug dealing and shooting people and all your time in prison like what, what's been your biggest lesson well my biggest lesson is if i can wake up again and be 14 years old and innocent i'd be saying to myself what the fuck are you thinking yeah you know because when i wake up and you know most kids are going to the beach i was going to train i was going to run i was going to do push-ups and work out to play baseball i was a full you know i was a big ball player baseball player boxer but i took all those training tips and it became a violent guy mm -hmm. you know batting guys taking guys heads off stabbing guys and uh, really, I'd have to say to me, what, what exactly what I just said, and I repeat it, what the fuck am I thinking? Why am I out there not enjoying life? And that's the message, really, when you're talking to kids, is there's so many good things you can do with yourself. Go to the beach. Life's beautiful. Travel. Go country to country like I did, but don't yeah, do but it Yeah, you need money to do it. all that, right? <laughs> well, not necessarily. I mean, there's kids all, you know, that go, especially in European kids, they go abroad and they go from hostel to hostel. They mm. go with a group of kids. 
you save a couple of bucks, you go by train, you hike, you walk, you take uh, buses. You could do it on a tr cheap route, but go experience the world. That's the difference. And I mean, listen, you can always, you know, there's kids at young kids, you know, deliver newspapers, uh, go hustle around legitimate, be a way to be a bus boy, you know, work in stores, you know, work on trucks, whatever. Yeah. You don't need a hundred grand to go travel Europe. You can get cheap tickets and mm -hmm. go live life. But the idea is the more you experience life, the more you experience different countries, you understand the world a little better and mm -hmm. maybe you wouldn't risk your life so easily like a lot of us do. Yeah. And you know, you get a lot of the inner city kids that I speak up for that, uh, you know, you talk about, uh, Oprah Winfrey we'll use for an example and the inner city kids you're you're out in Africa and I feel bad for what goes on in Africa but if she wants to donate money what's wrong with our kids here in the United States donate it here help the kids here help mm -hmm. the school system uh, and and help everybody get in the right direction there's a lot of famous people out there that do the right thing and she is one of them but I think it needs to start here in our in in our country where yeah. there's so many kids that need a helping hand, and uh, I think that's mm -hmm. uh, where it should be. You know, that's where it should start, not out, not outside the country. Can you kind of give me the gist or ex give me the backstory of what the relationship was between you and John Gotti Jr.? Well, you know, I was a guy that was uh, put in a position to, you know, take care of him, protect him, and uh, we had fallen outs over the years. Uh, his father was in a position whether you like him as a boss or not, became a boss. And uh, although I disagreed on his leadership in a lot of ways, he was a gangster. Uh, the son, on the other hand, was uh, what I call a spoiled brat. Uh, right. uh, guys make fun of him, call him diaper, uh, diaper Don now, and different <laughs> things because of what he does with the media as far as you know, social media I'm talking about. He doesn't get on. He just did a, They just made a movie about him, right? They did a movie and made a movie about his father. It, tanked uh, about his father okay yeah. with John Travolta John Travolta it was a disaster of a film they say it was the worst film ever in the history of mobs really but be, again because the son tried to hold and control mm. the what was you know being written how it was being written and you know he destroyed uh, whatever they were trying to do with the movie by trying to control it so mm -hmm. right. this is the problem with him he's uh, doesn't do anything where he comes out in a positive manner tries to help some kids doesn't come out and be truthful you know we have to just what i did i had to catch him as uh an informant and uh there's there's no listen you're an informant there's no way to back out of that you're a queen of the day there's no way to say i only ratted a little bit or you know these ridiculous comments and i hate to always go into it about him because he's uh nothing to me in in my country in albanian there's a terminology for a barking dog you know, you ever see these little dogs, like a little chihuahua, when they don't stop, stop yapping and barking. And, you know, we say just keep walking and keep walking past them. That dog's going to be barking forever. Right. You know, so, you know, he's a barker. He's a guy that, you know, never did no work. If You know, he wasn't violent in the street. The guys like me did that stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. he's uh, on a poor me syndrome. Nobody wants to hear that. You know, stand on your own two feet. Say, listen, I, I lived a life I shouldn't have. We dealt drugs, uh, yeah, maybe I didn't by my own hand uh, go out and hurt all these guys, but guys like me did, and uh, right. you know, do something positive. Kids, you know, stop whining and crying, stop blaming your father for putting you in this life. Uh, yeah. And uh, then you try to you know, make money off your father's legacy or whatever, you, whether you agree with the lifestyle of his father or how he led, which you know, I'm not a big advocate as him as a leader, but the father was of, who he of was. Of him or his, or his dad? Uh, the father's leadership. Right. I mean, the son, I don't even really, I There's don't no, even like talking about him anymore. I mean, no. Just, there's really not much to say or there's something left to say. Do you think uh, that you guys will ever mend the relationship? I mean, we got, we got, you guys were pretty good friends at one point, right? Uh, I don't know if we were friends. I know the media said we were friends. I mean, okay. I said, you know, at times, yeah, we were friends, but, you know, I work with them. It was a working relationship. Okay. And, you know, I, I when depends on how I feel that day. I say I babysit him. You know, he's just a spoiled guy. You know, he, until he faces the, the truth about himself, that he was spoiled, that he was kind of a bratty kid, uh, spoon fed, uh, you know, fed and uh, spoon fed. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to have too many good things to say about him until he steps up, he's, you know, he becomes a man and does the right thing with kids and, you know, stops bullshitting everybody and, you mm -hmm. know, just say, hey, listen, if there's a way to change that you were queen of the day, I just want to know about it. But 
there really is no way to change that. You were queen of the day. Well, I was in penitentiaries and other guys, and you started talking, giving us up. We don't know exactly how many times you met, and we don't know if it was for years, but you were an informant, and there's no way of changing that. You took yourself in and met with the government, and uh, you're trying to spin it somehow, and there's no street guy, not one, that will say anything different but that he was an informant and a cooperator rat or any dumb word that he uses. So and, queen, uh, so the term queen of the day is basically a rat or a snitch. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Yeah, well, you... So you, I've never heard that one before. Yeah, it's... Uh, well, it's, you're not a gangster, so... That's true. <laughs> <if you're>, yeah. <laughs> Good observation. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so if you're in the street, we all know what it is. There's no excuse for it. You made it an appointment to meet the government. You're queen of the day. You're a rat, snitch, whatever, informant. Right. So guys like... And that's the thing. He, he's trying to sell something to guys like you that don't know what all this is. Okay. So gangsters know what it is and uh, street guys or criminals. And so, you know, there, there is no change in that. You know, the problem is with most kids, younger kids, when they get involved in the street, they don't understand informants. They don't understand when they're staying with 10 kids. They'll think that somebody's never, you know, he's a stand-up guy or the, by the street uh, mentality, stand-up guy, and he's not going to talk to the police. But then there's three cores of the guys are going into the police and they're giving information and people don't know it. And as... Yeah, Time because you, on. yeah, I mean, it, it seems like one of like the, the number one rule when it comes to any kind of, any kind of street business or, or anything, the number one rule is you never snitch, you never flip, right? Because that's, that's your dignity. That's, that's everything, right? That, that's what you're judged on. That's the number one thing you're judged, judged on. Well, so no one, if you want to, if you want to make it in, in organized crime or if you want to be in the mob, if you flip, you're dead, you're a dead man, right? Yeah, I mean, listen, by in simple ways, the way you're saying it, the belief on the street is that. But That's it, just my perspective. Yeah, I mean, listen, that's the problem is it's most kids' perspective. And, okay. And, and they don't understand the street. So when they're on the street and your partner's with a guy and he's stealing half the money or he's not giving you the fair share, so there's where it starts, right? He starts taking a little extra and he doesn't tell you and your partner's with him. So that's one problem. Okay. Who goes on the street, greed. Second problem is guys start stealing each other's girlfriends and women when they're not around. So that's the second part. There's the second part mm -hmm. is no loyalty. Third part is when something dangerous goes on and it's going to be you're going to get shot or he's going to get shot, you're going to run and let him get shot. Mm. Uh, fourth part is guys are going to, as soon as they run into a little problem or their, their girlfriend or boyfriend or mother or father may be involved with them, they're going to sell you out to protect them. So th there is no real code of honor like everybody thinks. It's garbage. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the telltale for everything, read, I don't care what religion you are, read the Quran, read the Bible, read whatever. Uh, if you're Buddhist, yeah. uh, money is evil, right? And this is what the problem is. Money is controlling the streets. And as long as money controls the streets, the loyalty isn't to your friend or to your partner or to an organization. It's to the dollar bill. And instead of following a path where you can make a dollar bill the right way, everybody's trying to take a shortcut. And at the same time, they're selling each other out left and right. And it's not something I, I'm talking about and somebody says, oh, he's full of shit. Just go look at history. Go follow religion and watch all the murders that go on through history. Yeah. Follow the wars, follow the Roman Empire and see what everything's about. Watch a movie like The Braveheart and see what it's about being taxed and taking money from the poor. And then it's also about f watch somebody that has no money, the inner city kids, and when they get jammed up or locked up, watch how many years they get compared to some rich kid that's got the money, like uh, Gotti did, to deceive and lie and inform and, and weasel his way out and, and pay his way. So, you know, it's not structured fairly and the, and, and the world's not fair. So... If you want to level the ground in a fair way, go to work the right way, and you don't have to worry about all those things I just spoke about. Right, right. And take the right path, because it's easy to take the wrong path. I mean, listen, I took the, the, the wrong path my whole life. I've been, you know, stabbed up, I've been shot, I've been batted, I spent 18 years in prisons, I spent <sighs> probably a, a good uh, last 10 years of my life uh, in, in prisons were without a, a yard, I didn't see a yard, I was locked up 23 hours a day at 24, uh, I shower three, four days a week at best, and I spent probably seven years in solitary confinements. Oh, so God. when people say, uh, you know, fuck you, or they don't want to hear what you got to say, listen, I can't make everybody listen, but I hope the people that uh, are suffering a little bit or people that have jammed up with cases or people are thinking about going that way uh, take a second uh, 
a second stance and say, you know, I don't want to end up in these prisons. I don't want to be shot in the head because, you know, I can maneuver guys all over. That's what I did for a living. I get friendly with you. And uh, after I get friendly with you, you think you're involved with us and I shoot you in the head. It's, it's done just as easy as that. And if I know you had $300,000 in your house, well, there's your life was worth to me, 300000 know, Your life's finished. So if you think there's a code between uh, guys and there's guys a lot more vicious than I am. So that's the reality of the street. Holy shit. It's not all my stories. You can go listen to podcasts. After yeah. podcasts, mob, different mob, true life stories of different yeah. mobsters that are talking. When they go to jail and, you know, their partners are rich mm -hmm. and they're st sitting in jail doing a time for another guy, that other guy that's out there making money, he's not helping his family like he promised. He's not doing anything. He's not visiting him in prison. He's not uh, stepping up and, and doing anything to help that guy get through the time and and you're gonna hear these stories they're gonna have guys sleeping with guys wives and girlfriends these yeah. are regular stories these right. aren't you know this is not something that we don't know that we don't you know think wow that's a big surprise that happened to the guy right. i mean every time i hear another guy telling a story i'm gonna say well this is exactly what we already know about you know so i'm a guy that's been in prisons and i've been international i have friends in every country you name a country and i'll tell you i could get you in touch with somebody in that country so, you know, it, it, I'm not just some neighborhood gangster. You know, I was a guy that traveled. I just came back from traveling four countries. I probably, since I've been home, went to about 25, 30 countries. So I know the world. I know people everywhere, every country. So how did you transition from New York and Florida to going overseas? What were you doing overseas? Well, you know, since I'm a kid, you know, I had friends in different positions, different uh, mob families outside of the Gambino and the Italian mafia. So I had organizations that were friends with me with, from the Columbia, which I was doing business in the cocaine business. Okay. I have a friend of mine, Klaus, that did uh, business with me since the early 90s in, with marijuana from California, from Denmark. So we're still good friends. I got friends that uh, were the bosses in, uh, in families where ran things in the UK, like the Sabinis that I'm still friends with. Uh, so I can go through my, my Albanian culture. I'm Albanian. We're a very you know, rough, hands-on kind of culture, very mm -hmm. violent. Oh, yeah. Uh, we come from you know, a suppressed country from the Ottoman days till Turkey taking us over to uh, communism. So you know, I have friends in Albania and, and uh, guys that were in business with me for years that are back in that country, uh, Italy. Uh, so I can go on with country to country, Germany, uh, Switzerland. So, you know, these are all partners and friends of mine over mm -hmm. the years that, that uh, were in all these countries. So I, I traveled those countries. I had hooks in those countries. Canada, I have hooks in those countries. And we did business, whether it was through money, whether through drugs, whether it was through sports, whether it was helping each other. If a friend of mine had a problem in the UK, which he did, and somebody came to the United States, he asked me to go hurt him from my did. Mm -hmm. So we reached uh a lot further than, you know, a typical, you know, a lot of these mob guys never leave the neighborhood of Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, Manhattan, wherever. And I had the ability because of some of the contacts I have around the world to uh, have the ability to do what I want. And I also did it in a, in a good way. I have the ability to go visit those countries and hang out, drink and have some fun. So I choose my life a little different now to yeah, have some sure. fun, drink and uh, and talking about, you know, different things in those countries. And I'm doing shows and magazines about prison in Brazil. And some of the guys that were in prison with me in Brazil are from the UK. They just did a show with me in the UK and they talked about uh, exactly how dangerous the jails were there and how they survived through me in those prisons. And, the prisons in Brazil? Yeah, I was in, I was in three different penitentiaries. In yeah, Brazil, three in Brazil. different prisons in Brazil. Yeah. So. What was that like? Like, give, can you give me just one insane, well, yeah, I, I one specific you. story about oh, yeah. a Brazil prison experience? So, you know, when guys say to them, you know, you, you, you watch movies at concentration camps. And yeah. You watch movies in the army. And it's no different than that. We were in a Brazilian penitentiary. And uh, when they come crashing through those doors during the riots and they come in with ski masks. And I'm talking about military police, police, uh, SWAT teams in those countries. They'll uh, strip us down. We're all naked. Guns to our heads. Uh, you know, you beat up a little bit, you pistol whipped a little bit, depending if you're the wrong inmate and the wrong cop. But guys are getting beat up all over. The guys are getting raped within the jails from the from the guards. And uh, we're brought into a, 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 some occasions we're brought into a dark, uh, like a gymnasium, but there's no lights. 
and it's probably 120 degrees in there, 115 degrees. And some of these guys that were with me in the UK are st starting to come out and speaking because they didn't like what uh, Gotti tried to project about the prisons that we were in, and he tried to underplay uh, how many killings were in these jails, and I'm talking about dozens of them. Why would he try to do that? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess you're going to have to ask him that if you ever do an interview with anybody. And, you know, these things like we're doing here, they're not, you you know this, obviously. You can ask any question you want. I don't yeah. prearrange them. Right. I talk just from the heart. I talk out of experience. So yeah. He's not able to do that because he's lied so often. And uh, right. he talks out of school and he doesn't realize there's guys all over the world that were in those prisons with us, that we all stay in touch with each other. We just had a, a reunion. You were the guys like the, you were like the feet on the ground guys. You guys were in the trenches together. Yeah, and you know, you got guys from Turkey that were with us, Spain that were with us, Denmark mm. that was with, with, with us, uh, a couple of Italian guys from Italy that were with us. So when someone talks like he does and he tries to bullshit the public a little bit, these guys just came out of the woodwork and uh, we, we're looking to do some shows now on the Brazilian penitentiaries that we were in, some of the riots some of the things that I just spoke about, the rapes, uh, an inmate being hung and accused of uh, committing a crime he didn't commit. He didn't commit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, excuse me. I gotta, no, it's okay. You can, if you need to an answer, you can answer. No, I don't need Okay. So you have uh, guys coming out of woodwork and they weren't happy with some of the things that were said. And uh, they wanted to set the record straight. At the same time, uh, they're starting to do uh, podcast shows about yeah. their experience in these prisons, uh, how mm -hmm. they survived them. Mm -hmm. how they credited me for some of the violence I committed in those prisons to save them and some of the stabbings I did mm -hmm. and uh, some of the killings they witnessed, some of the rapes they witnessed uh, and the conditions of uh, rats all over the, the cells right. and uh, poison and mosquitoes like crazy. Some of the people they seen die because we were so below in a, in a, in a cage that was like i guess uh like like the old days torture chambers almost of the castles you see in the movies you really can't understand because these uh, t t these uh prisons like a state senator from brazil said he wouldn't want to spend the day there he'd rather die first so these are documented well documented the the, the uh the uh torture was well documented and the murders after it from prisons after guys were getting killed and tortured they were sending guys out from the street to kill those same guards that were torturing, raping. Really? So the guards and the police officers started wearing masks, uh, black uh, ski masks so people wouldn't know their face. But some of the uh, the uh, organizations in Brazil that were very violent on the street yeah. started ringing their doorbells when they answered them. They were shooting them in the head to try to get even for what they were doing in the prison system. I mean, this is all CNN documented stuff. And I was in some of the prisons they talk about. Mm -hmm. And some of the guys that we meet with, are, uh, we're discussing, uh, obviously, a TV series about it. And uh, these guys from these countries uh, saw some of the things, obviously, were involved in what I was involved in. And uh, I got off course when we were in those rooms. It, it was probably 500 guys, 600 guys in a caged-in room nowhere to shit, nowhere to piss, and would be, we all of us as selectively would select one place in the corner, no toilet paper, no shirts, because we're naked. Yeah. And we're, we're brought in there, like I said, like a concentration camp, and we, you know, you're stepping in, walking on piss and shit, but we try to limit it to one corner, because we're there from some mornings when they do these, these attacks on the inmates. We're there from six in the morning, say, till 10 at night. Uh -huh. There's nowhere to sit, nowhere, you're, you're standing. And you're suffering and guys are passing out and guys, uh, you know, some guys in some occasions were dying from the God, air quality, man. couldn't breathe. And uh, I mean, th these are no secrets to the international world of uh, mm -hmm. what went on in some of these jails that we were in. And it's no secret because it was uh, documented in TV shows with CNN and news, uh, Associated Press across yeah. the world. And some of these guys uh, got in touch with me. Thank you to Gotti. Really? I got to say thank you to Gotti for that because they didn't know how to get in touch with me. And when we were in the media and they seen it, they reached out and got a hold of some of them, got a hold of my daughter and said, we need to speak to your father. He saved our life. Really? In, in prison. And she said to me, Dad, do you know who Justin is? And do you know who O is? And she started giving me names. And I said, yeah, why? And she said, I didn't know if it was real or not. They reached out to me on Facebook and said, uh, your dad saved our life and we want to talk to him. So this is uh, some, of the, some of the guys. And we're very, you know, we, we never forget each other because we went through hell with each other. And uh, we had a certain bond. And that one of our reunions was just last week in, in the UK. 
and we discussed with the, a guy who was, uh, played Captain America, actually, in the UK, uh, Fabrizio uh, Santini. And uh, we talked to him about maybe getting involved in a project with us and and my life story and some of the things that we're, we're thinking about doing. So, uh, you know, out of things that are bad, sometimes things... A lot of positive. Can a lot come of positive. Out of that, I mean, you got to make it positive. And, that, and really, that's the bottom line. Right? I really don't care for Gotti too much is because... He's a guy that uh, wants to sit and shit, right? He doesn't want to turn things around and do something positive. And if he started talking well and, and, and talking to children and talking to kids about not uh, being in the life maybe or not being in the street, you can sell your own bullshit story all you want. I mean, we can't change who we were and what we did. That's not going to change, obviously. So mm -hmm. we got to live with that. But let's sell something different to the kids now. Yeah. You know, kids that are suffering or... You know, there's kids that I know, real tough street kids that talk to me, send me messages. They're involved in the street, and I try to talk them out of the street. Yeah, they laugh, that's they hard joke. to do, right? Well, you know what, because maybe they're not ready. Some of them are. I mean, I got, uh, I get dozens of letters out of prisons all the time, guys, you know, you know, giving, commending me for what I do. And there's yeah. guys that are in prisons that are never going to change, but say, you know, tell me, keep doing your thing. So, you know, there's a lot of positive guys out there in the prison system that mm -hmm. believe in what I'm doing. And uh, I guess the negative people are always going to be negative. I can't change that. It's a different breed of person. Some, someone who has kind of been handed everything they have. They never really had to suffer for it or really work for it. You know, it's just a it's something that you can't really teach. It's They're just different. You know what I mean? They're just a different breed. When, you, when you've had to go through hell and you've had to earn everything that you have there's a disconnect there between someone else who's just been given everything. Not, I'm not saying that you guys are, he's that, or you're the yeah, I opposite. I know what you're saying. I'm just saying it's, it's... Listen, I, I can tell you this. At my age, and growing up in jails the way I did, yeah. I was a young kid the first time I went, I met some tough, tough guys in prison. So when guys think they're tough out in the street, you can think you're tough all you want. When you get into all these prisons, there's so many tough guys in there. There's so many dangerous guys in there. There's so many killers in there. You know, there's the, you're nothing in there just like anybody else. You're just another number. You're another guy trying to get through the day. Mm -hmm. And you, the reality of the real tough guys in prison, the real street guys in prison, the guys that say to themselves, I don't want to see my kid ever spend a day here because we understand what it is. So the guys that say anything different than that, you let me know who he is. When you see some jack off in, on the internet and they're writing some dumb shit about the code, I'm gonna tell that fucking guy that's writing about the code. First off, you never lived. You live. You never lived the code. You don't have no idea what we're, our life's about. Because there's definitely gonna be comments on this uh, talking always, shit. You well, know? you always get dummies that talk yeah. shit. You can't stop that. Yeah, the These cubicle are guys life. That, people that hate their lives. They just want to. Well, they want ten seconds of attention. Yeah. So you can give it to them. But if they want that attention like that, well, go join. Jump in. Get to jail. Right. And, right. And we're gonna see how tough you are and see if you're talking. They're not gonna do that. They don't have the nuts to do yeah. that. But what I was getting at is these inmates that are in jail and there's thousands and thousands right across right. the country every country you're not going to find one that's going to send a message out different than that to their own children they don't want their kids living this life so you know if we can all talk to kids and guys in and i'm talking about inmates that are on death row inmates that are in supermax jails any if you ask any of them there's none of them are going to say oh this is a great life i want my kid in the street Right. So, you know, we did what we did. They did what they did. I'm in a position, whether somebody likes me or dislikes me, I can't change that. And when someone says, well, this guy hurt so many guys, or, oh, he's full of shit, he didn't hurt that many, I really don't give a fuck, you know? So these are the guys that are, you know, bullshit bitch guys that talk like this, and, yeah. you know, they're not tough guys, they're not men, and when they're mm -hmm. talking like this, well, I'm going to tell that same big mouth that says something different or the code, go put your fucking kid on the street. All right. If that's what you believe, tough guy, go put, but I'm going to tell you something else. Any of the real tough guys, because there's a lot on the street and in jail, they're not going to be writing on your computer about any of this show. Hell no. This is just jerk offs that talk like that. Yeah, it's yeah. true. That's true. Uh, yeah. That's a fact. Um, now, you said how much time did you do in solitary? I probably did. I never counted day for day, but I've done probably about seven years in, in solitary confinement. I didn't see a yard. Not not continuous. That was just told. I was in and out of them, but, yeah. uh, but it, well, I'll tell you what. I was in Brazil penitentiary for two and a half years. I had seen a yard once a month, naked, uh, in my underwear at best, no shoes, nothing. I'm rocks. And it's not a yard like you see a yard. I'm not talking about a yard. I'm talking about 
uh, high security, gun patrols. Uh, they're up in the towers, uh, dogs all over you. And it's, uh, I guess, the size of a basketball court at best. I got that once a month. Otherwise, I was caged in. I never Jesus. left the cells. Uh, I was in cells with 54 guys that fit 12 guys, sometimes higher than that in the 60s. It rained inside the cells. They had water that went up to our knees at points uh, during the storms. Uh, there was blackouts, complete no lights. So, you know, th that was the conditions. When I came to Florida, I was out on the tiers for a while, but you're on tiers that you don't go out to a yard. You what go does that to mean? Another cage. Tiers? Tiers are your double level tiers in Florida prisons. Oh, okay. uh, and you don't really leave the, that, that pod. Uh, then I went into solitary cells uh, for a couple of years. And then I was in MCC forced into a unit where uh, there's nine cells on the floor and you're not leaving those cells. And you're, you're stuck there 23, 24 hours. And you go up on a basketball court at night. Uh, for about an hour, three days a week. So I never seen an actual yard. So that was 10 years of that. Uh, prior to that, I was in and out of uh, solitary confinement for fights, six months at a time, eight months. I was I did about a year straight at another time. So yeah, I spent my fair, fair share of time in, in uh, solitary confinement. And listen, I'm no different because you'll hear guys complaining about it. But when you're a high-profile inmate, which I was, I was chased down by Interpol in every country, and uh, when you're killing guys and hurting guys, I'm no different than a lot of these guys. We're all going to the same thing. So what I'm saying is uh, it's not a life to live like a dog in a cage right. and showering and with a camera watching you, and you, you know, you're on these secure cells. So there's cameras in the room. You take a shit, they're watching you. Yeah. You feel horny that day and you want to jerk off, they're watching you. So this is the life that you chose to lead. Yeah. So when a guy talks uh, out of school and you're going to get dummies that talk like that all the time, they have no idea about how I lived and a lot of inmates just like me. It's not, I'm um, poor me, only I did that. Right. It happens to all of us. We all go on diesel therapy, meaning they ship you from, they used to book me into my cell here in Florida. Right? This is mm -hmm. when they brought me back. Diesel therapy? Diesel therapy. This is what they would do to me. They'd bring me to a jail on Wednesday. Okay. I'd wait all day and get checked in through booking. So you're in the, on the floor about eight hours waiting and fingerprinted and chained up. And they bring you to a holding cell and they bring you to your solitary confinement cell. You get in there Wednesday night and you can't order commissary because you just came in. By Sunday... Instead of letting me order, because they come around with the commissary lists and I could fill them out, I'm moving again. They're going to ship me to another jail, and we're going to do it all over again. And when they ship me in, and this is constant for me for a good year, and I didn't see no commissary, didn't see no books, I didn't have no radio. So when guys talk about how, how the life is and how they can talk, they have no clue. They're clueless because they didn't go through all this. And I'm not the only guy. I'm one of the guys of high you know security inmates that are uh, known to be dangerous were moved around with chain belly chains and chains on our legs on our feet on our hands uh, with black box where you can't move also uh, and possibly get out of those handcuffs this is typical treatment of any of us that are in those positions wow so when someone says like they're the only ones that's bullshit too yeah. that's you know maybe the, the average inmate don't go through this but we do yeah. So, you know, these are the things that you're trying to tell. And there's some serious killers in prisons now that mm -hmm. write me and stay in touch with me on a regular basis and are never getting out. And these guys are uh, guys that are saying to me, brother, keep doing what you're doing. Really? Save some kids. Yeah, because, you know, only haters don't want to see this. Right. They're, they're, you know, when people are jealous or people hate yeah. uh, another, another man's life, they want to see that person suffer, right? Mm -hmm. So I see you doing good. Mm -hmm. Should I bring you down or should I pick you up? So right. I, I choose to pick you up. Yeah. You know, if I've you dealt with a lot of people who like to talk down and, and shove you in the dirt and tell you you're nothing. And Well, I don't know you if you're a fighter. Do you fight? Do you get into fights? No, I don't get okay. into fights. So here's I used to do, uh, I've done like uh, jujitsu and that kind of shit, but I've never been, I haven't been, I've been in like two street fights in high school. Well, did, well I'm going to tell you, did you get paid for those two street fights? Hell no. <laughs> yeah, so why would you want to fight? Exactly. Okay, and you're going to tell me that you can beat everybody up in the street? Of course not. Can I? Of course not. Right. These guys out there every day can beat up the next guy. I, I use Mike Tyson as an example. Uh -huh. Toughest guy around. And there's idiots that get drunk that want to fight him. Right. Exactly. I mean, so, you know, and same with him. He lost plenty of fights. The idea of fighting the street, what does it get here? 
I says, you're going to run into a jerk off that's drunk or high and he wants to fight you. Exactly. Walk away, let him fight somebody else. Eventually he'll run into the guy that wants to, that he'll get what he wants. <laughs> yeah. He's going to beat him up. Right. But if you're not getting paid for it, why you bother doing it? Right. So, you know, and jujitsu and the things you're in, those are positive reinforcements. They mm -hmm. learn to teach you to respect the sport, not disrespect the sport. Mm -hmm. And the idea of me telling you, uh, do you fight? I respect you the same way if you never got into a fist fight in your life. Right. That's not a judgment of being a man or not. Right. The judgment of being a man is being gentleman, go to work, do the right thing, and pass a, a positive message, right? So, right. You know, it's easy to pass, uh, pass a, a, a bullshit message. I can I can soup up, and, you know, I probably got one of the strongest guys in as far as having a following in every country. I can soup guys up all over and have guys using guns and shooting people for me. I could, uh, wow. if I felt like taking Gotti tomorrow, it's th that easy. And if okay. somebody says anything different, uh, then they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And in, just in my culture, guys will do anything I want when I want. I don't live that life anymore. So, uh, you know, my message isn't about Gotti or guys like Gotti. My message is for those guys that are in prisons, the inner city kids or the tough guys in those prisons that are sending messages out to me. Mm -hmm. John, keep doing what you're doing. Save some kids' lives. Because our lives were ruined. Let's not. Let's help these kids not ruin this. Right. You, you, you know, you talk about Gotti, and I think I, I said this earlier. I hit on Gotti before, you know, before we wrap it up. Is, you know, some of his family members are uh, really guys that their family suffered. And, you know, and I've talked about... Gotti, you're talking about Gotti's family members? Yeah, yeah. Some of them, also in the life and jails and some of their kids and some of the things that went on. I want to see him tell somebody this was a good life. You know, I, I want to see him say, you know, oh, I want my son in this life. Right. Because there's nobody that's going to say this. So if you can find me one, I'd love to get on the air with you with him. Or I'll come and meet right. him and sit down. And Someone what? who's proud of that life? What dummy wants their kid in that life? Right. Call your father, to call each kid. And there's kids out there that don't have parents that aren't able to, to anybody to tell them this. Mm. But those kids that don't have parents, there's no excuse to be in the street. I used it as an excuse. There's no ex I have parents. But, you know, none of us come from a perfect life. And my, my parents weren't the greatest parents in the world. None of, nobody's parents are perfect. And mm. we're not perfect. But to push somebody in the street, you got to be a real scumbag. So... I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm not pushing no kid that way. I'll push him this way. And hopefully I can reach some and mm -hmm. some adults too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people ask you, well, he's talking about this gangster. I know a lot of gangsters. Mm -hmm. No one's ever going to say, you're not going to hear me deny that I'm not friends with a lot of gangsters. Right. But I'm not choosing their path for them. They can choose their own. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's what they choose, unfortunately, I think eventually they're going to suffer the path they're taking, right? But... I'm not going to choose. I mean, they're friends when we joke around and, uh, you know, I, I use the word I'm retired, right? That's my word. You're retired. So I'm retired. That's you, it. you look like you still put a beating on somebody. <laughs> I, you know, listen, I work out every day. Yeah. Push-ups in the gym. I box still. I'm still pl playing around with bags and all that. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's in a, in a positive way again. You yeah. Know, you get in the ring, you play around with guys and, you you know, if you were in a ring and you're sparring. Right. Eh, without the attitude of the street. The street is... is uh, like I said, listen, I'm involved in the fight business. I'm friends with a lot of professional fighters. And, you know, we joke about it all the time because there's guys out in the street have no idea some of these guys are and they want to fight them. <laughs> so, you know, they say the same thing I'm saying. Uh, you want to fight? You can fight all day. Go to gyms every day. You can find a million guys to fight. You're that insecure? Go to, go to a gym. Right. You know, so. But, uh, that, that you know, my message is that. And hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, some of the things I'm doing now is going to be uh, the mm -hmm. magazines and the shows and the TV series. They're all coming now. So this year is going to be a great year. I got a new book coming out. Yeah, Dark. tell me about your book. What's uh, what's it called? Darkest Hour 2. It's coming out with uh, Susan Pike as my writer. I did Darkest Hour 1. It was about when I was a child to 17. Prior to that, I had Gotti's Rules with George Anastasia. And I have a handbook out uh, called Prison Rules. The do's and don'ts so you don't find yourself in prison. Okay. And, uh, the situation for adults, young, you know, kids and for parents that need to try to reach their, their, their children. Maybe they, you know, and that's, that, that's a book them. people that are in prison, they can get their hands on. Yeah. All these books are, you know, through the internet, through Amazon, through, uh, through, uh, Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. and, uh, Darkest Hour 2 should be out by February and that'll be more of uh, uh hardcore mafia stuff and some of the killings and shootings and, uh, 
things that went on in prison systems. Wow. And man. so that, that, that their book would, uh, I think, uh, will be a little more, uh, uh, to the point. Can you tell me like, what did, like, what did you have to do? Like, how did you get out of prison so quick? Did you have like good behavior? Was there, I mean, <laughs> hey, it might've been quick for you, but it wasn't quick for me. I mean, listen, when you're well, in jail, all right, obviously, but I mean, what I, what I meant by that was like, you, you do, you did about 18 years total, right? Yeah, I did. And, and uh, you were originally sentenced to 30. Well, at thir no, I was facing 30 when I came back and okay. then I sat down with the government after I had the paperwork on Gotti and some of the other guys had, okay. you know, 54 guys went and testified against me in a grand jury. So, you know, holy shit. So it wasn't one or two. And then I, on some other shows, I and mean, if somebody's interested, they could look what I said. And I named boss after boss that would testify and give information. So these guys, these guys tried to, I, died, these guys betrayed you. Yeah, these they, guys. yeah, they ain't switching this around. They betrayed me. I didn't betray them by their set of rules. Uh, they all ratted. Uh, later on, I come in and and I said that that's it. After I went through each boss and each captain, and they're making statements all of them against me. And so you know, without getting into all that crap, people can look at my books and read yeah. or watch some of the other interviews, and they can see it. But uh, this is the typical, what I said about the treachery of life. I was betrayed. I never betrayed anybody. God, he betrayed me. I was in a penitentiary. Even though he was my enemy at that time, he's still betraying what we believed was the life of, right. of a, a good soldier, a mobster. But uh, that's, that's the reality of, of what happens. But I did on this case, back to the 30 years, is Brazil uh, extradition law. When you come back, I'm facing to do 25 years. When I did two and a half years in Brazil, I was supposed to get nine years credit because of the conditions there. Right. So if you give me the nine years that they're supposed to give me, and I'm supposed to do 25, I'm supposed to do 16 more. Right at that 16, I took a 12-year sentence. I got it down to 10. Okay. So I, I did a lot of time for what I did, actually, on you know laws. Because these guys, people don't understand that take pleas on murders and get four or five years or six years. Uh, don't cooperate. Some of them do, and they get less. But... You know, when, you, when you're, they're in that position and whatever the situation that case is, I know bosses got 10 years, on, they went on a run, they caught them, they had two separate trials, and they still only got 10 years without cooperation. Wow. Because of the situation, it depends on that they have weapons. So we'll get into one last thing before I leave. Okay. I never been caught with any kind of crime, nothing on this case. On the case that I was facing life and I went on a run and I had the extradition of 30 years, so you know, it's only from what the Gaudis or somebody will say, rats. It was informants. It was only testimony. It, was it testimony. wasn't me selling a drug and someone caught me. It wasn't me getting caught with kilos. It wasn't me on an audio tape or a videotape. It wasn't me at a shooting or at a killing. It wasn't me getting caught with a used weapon. It wasn't me anywhere. So when people use the excuse of, uh, well, it was all rats against me and everybody's a rat, 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 rat. And they right. talk that they're usually a rat like God he was. Nobody knocked on my door and said, oh, we're going to arrest you for all these crimes because we don't like you. Listen, I'm a It criminal. was people trying to save their own fucking ass. Yeah, and mostly, yeah. you know, the mob guys that testified against me and gave information on the sneak against me and were informants. But listen, I'm okay with it. My life's not at that point anymore. I don't give a fuck what right. they did. I don't really give a fuck what Wash God your hands. did. But don't change the, the storyline. The storyline is you guys ratted, betrayed me. I left this country, left my children, left my family, stood in those concentration camps not to talk against my enemies or my friends. You all betrayed me and came home and that changed. So when someone says who betrayed who, I didn't betray anybody by mm -hmm. those rules. But those rules and that life's gone for me. Yeah, but we'll keep that record straight that I never got caught. So this paperwork they can go check. I never been caught with a crime, so I, I wasn't a talker. And these shows now, my life's different, so I can go on here and talk and be on, you know, honest on exactly what happened. But I've never been caught with a crime. The ones I got caught prior to that with a gun, I did my three and a half years. I did my year. I did my whatever time I did on other assaults, and I went to jails for them. Mm -hmm. This case here, Rico indictment for a life sentence and i ran and i went to 20 countries when they caught me it was only from informant after informant, mob guy after mob guy made guy after made guy boss of different families all giving information against me not the other way around so somewhere in this public they switched that around and they thought that hey this guy was given no i left this country i spent millions of dollars to fight uh and left my children fight with lawyers attorneys investigators I lost my family over this. So when people say I betrayed something, they better do a little more research and find out who betrayed who. And there's nothing. Public information can get court documents if, I, if I've ever been caught with any kind of crime. Nothing. Wow. 
That's heavy, man. Dude, yeah. thank you. So I can't thank you enough for thank coming you. on here and sharing your story. Yeah, I appreciate it's it if great. you push that message to kids and, yeah. and outside this podcast and yeah. keep doing the right thing. Cool. Well, Mirta Popshim, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Probably man. It's, it's been awesome. 